Hello, this is Matthew, and welcome to part two in our video series on IBM Power Systems. In part one, we set up our new to us Power 720 server uh, with the Power 7 processor. We got the service processor password resets so that we were able to get in, perform a complete factory reset on the machine, and then we set up all of our disks in the RAID configuration that we wanted. So if you've not seen that video and you want to follow through the series from the start, I will put a link to that first video down in the description. You can check it out and then come back here when you're ready to keep following along, if that is in fact what you're doing. Otherwise, we are ready to go on part two. So what we're going to do in this part two video is install the virtual IO server, which also includes the integrated virtualization manager. So what that essentially does is give us the ability to share system resources between logical partitions and manage the logical partitions through a web interface that the virtual IO server gives us um, through that IVM integrated virtualization manager. Now, if you think about the VMware uh, server in the x86 world, you are probably familiar with the fact that you install VMware and, in fact, the ESXi uh, operating system as the sort of base operating system on a machine. And then that allows you to create virtual machines that share the uh, host system's network and disks in particular. In ESXi or in VMware, you're able to give all of the disks to VMware itself, and then you can create virtual disk files that the hypervisor presents to the guest operating systems as their hard drives. And then a similar thing with networks, right? There's virtual switches, and the hypervisor is able to create virtual network interfaces that share that same physical Ethernet connection. In the case of these logical partitions on a server like a power server, uh, and this is very similar, for example, to the hypervisor and partition, what they call logical domains in the Sun Spark world, uh, is that you're able to divvy up the machine's hardware resources and actually have hard partition boundaries. And the hypervisor is able to run, or I should say the hypervisor that's in the machine's firmware uh, controlled from the service processor in the case of these power machines is able to uh, run those partitions. They can have dedicated hardware and each partition can have its own dedicated storage controller, its own dedicated network interface. Uh, and you don't really need this virtual IO server at all. Uh, whereas if you want to run multiple VMs on an x86 system, you would typically have to install some kind of software hypervisor that uh, provides access to the hardware for that VM, uh, whether that's VMware, whether that's the Hyper-V stuff built into Windows, uh, whatever the case may be you have a model where it's not really all of the hypervisor services and the hardware partitioning being done in the machine's uh, firmware. In the case of power systems and Spark systems, as I mentioned, you are able to do that. But realistically, these particular power systems, this Power 720, uh, it's a relatively small system, uh, right? It's a 4U rack mount server. It has room for eight hard drives in it. Uh, it has... Uh, you know, one processor socket that has four cores, and it has two RAID controllers, um, although they're high availability linked. So as far as we're concerned, it has one RAID controller, and that one RAID controller owns all of the disks in the system, and we have one Ethernet card uh, that's in one PCI slot. So realistically, we can't divide this machine up into partitions that all have their own dedicated slice of the hardware. We want to do a more VMware-like model where we share the system resources as virtual devices that are then assigned to the various partitions we create. Uh, you know, we might have a Linux partition, we might have an AIX partition, we might have an IBM I partition. So we want to share that RAID array that we created 
and give that RAID array to a base operating system, which is then able to create virtual disks on it, which will essentially be files in the file system of that base operating system uh, to present to the guest operating systems, the partitions or the VMs. And that is what the virtual IO server allows us to do. Um, it is a feature that comes with PowerVM standard and PowerVM enterprise edition. So uh, that PowerVM edition is actually a license that you plug into the firmware of the machine. And then once you do, it's there forever. Even when you do a factory reset, uh, it's, it's permanently stored as part of, I, I think, the vital product data, the little VPD module that's on the motherboard. So if you are looking for used power uh, systems, and you're interested in running more than one operating system on them, uh, you know, actually uh, use logical partitions, you definitely want to make sure that the server you're buying is entitled for either PowerVM standard or enterprise, um, not just, I don't know what they call the PowerVM Lite, um, whatever the lowest edition is, uh, is not what you want. You want PowerVM standard or better. And with PowerVM standard, uh, comes the entitlement to run the virtual I.O. server, uh, which is really what we want. So what we're going to do today is install virtual I.O. server on our freshly set up Power 7 box. And uh, I'll show you uh, just kind of a quick demo of the initial setup of that through the IVM, the Integrated Virtualization Manager, which is a nice little web interface that we can use to manage the partitions and the virtual resources, as well as the real hardware resources of our system. One really important note is that the PowerVM uh, BIOS has moved on to version three. And in version three of BIOS, IBM has removed IVM, the Integrated Virtualization Manager. There is no longer a web server built into the BIOS operating system that lets you manage your partitions. Uh, in the real world, not in our little home labs where you know we have one used power server that we're just playing with for hobbyist purposes, at least that's what I do with it. Um, companies who buy a lot of power systems would probably also buy IBM's Power HMC, or Hardware Management Console product. And that's available from IBM both as an appliance, so an actual server that you put in a rack in your data center, and it runs the HMC software. It's also available from them as a VHMC, a virtual HMC, where they give you a VM image running the HMC software uh, that you can run in VMware or under KVM or um, I, they may give you a Zen image. So that lets you manage multiple power systems from one uh, central interface. It sort of takes over the hardware management and the partition management of the machine. It hooks up to the service processor of your machine uh, and becomes the management point, and it gets full control over the system. Now, I've used the HMC uh, to control power systems and control partitions on power systems. And quite frankly, it's awful. It's so much worse than the IVM integrated uh, virtualization manager interface that you got with BIOS 2. So, uh, you know, obviously, if you're in the corporate setting, if you have a lot of these systems, if you're using PowerVM Enterprise and you want to use its features like migrating partitions from one machine to another, uh, backed by the same shared fiber channel storage. That's the sort of thing that, yeah, you need to use uh, the HMC software for. But for anything else, right, unless you absolutely are in a situation when you need it, uh, I just, I don't like it at all. It's it's just really cumbersome to work with. It has this unnecessarily overly complicated for almost all use cases, um, partition profile management thing, and... Once you use IVM and you can just simply manage your partitions with IVM, uh, going and using the HMC is just an exercise in pain and frustration, <laughs> uh, and not due to lack of knowledge or anything. I've I've uh, I've used it quite a bit and and can get everything that I need to get done with it. Uh, I just don't like it. I I just it's awful. So anyway, what we're going to do is 
use the old version of BIOS, version 2, that when you install it on the bare metal of a server and you're not hooked up to an HMC, that's what then will give us the web interface to manage our partitions. And that's what we'll use to manage our machine from here on out. So with that introduction out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and I guess we can get logged in uh, back to that advanced system management console um, on our server, which is still powered off from after we shut down uh, after creating the RAID array with the standalone diagnostic CD. And I always like popping out the real-time progress indicator. Uh, among other things, that prevents your login session from timing out because given this refreshing every second, it's actually keeping your session alive. Um, one word of warning, when you are done with the little ASME interface here, always hit the logout button. Uh, if you just close this browser tab or open a new tab and go back here, um, it actually it keeps you in as a current logged in user and it only allows a small number of users to be logged in simultaneously. So you'll actually lock yourself out of being able to log into this thing until a previous session times out after you've just closed the window. But if you actually log out, it immediately clears out your session so that you're not at risk of not being able to immediately log right back in. Well, back to Vios. Um, so IBM has a little web portal called Entitled Systems Support. And if you own power servers, this is where you can download the software that you're entitled to use on them, um, primarily the operating systems and things like Vios. So IBM keeps track of what machines they sold to what customers and what uh, entitlements and licenses those customers have. And in the case of power systems, this is all done through the IBM mid-range resellers. So you'll go to an IBM business partner who sells uh, mid-range systems and IBM I and uh, the power servers, things like that. Um, I don't know, maybe they sell direct to huge customers, but for the most part, uh, these power systems are, are sold through their mid-range resellers. And when they do that, they will let IBM know when they pass the order up to IBM, what you bought, what software you bought with it, um, what licenses you need, all those kinds of things. And IBM will record that in their database. And that's tied to your machine uh, in their database. Now, when you buy a used machine off of, say, eBay, uh, as far as IBM's database is concerned, ownership of that machine hasn't transferred to you. So you won't be able to get license keys for um, like the IBM I products that may have been uh, licensed for that machine, unless you actually get them from the original company that owned the machine, if they're selling the machine to you, and if they have the right to transfer the license, if they didn't uh, you know, trade it in to get the licenses for their new Power 9 machine, if they're finally retiring their old Power 7 machine or something like that, um, you know, that's something for you to sort out with whoever actually has the license and whatever legal agreements they're under and whether they can do that. Um, if the licenses are still available and if you can get the machine's original owner to maybe work with their IBM reseller and work with you uh, to actually transfer the licenses to you, that's kind of the ideal scenario, but that's pretty rare. Uh, so if you're looking to buy used power hardware, just be aware, particularly if you're interested in running IBM I, the old OS 400 uh, operating system, um, be aware that it can be very tough to actually get the license keys you know, out of IBM or even out of the previous owner. Um, if you're buying directly from a company, a contact you have in a company that's retiring that hardware, it may be easier because right, they may still have it installed and they can just you know check the license keys and then they can actually give you um, their keys. Again, I don't know if they're software agreements with IBM even allow them to transfer it to third parties. But I have heard that some people have had luck um, transferring ownership of a machine that they got used um, with the help of friendly IBM mid-range resellers. So however you're getting the machine, you know, just be aware of what you want to run on it, what entitlements it might have, and the likelihood that you would actually be able to get the licenses or not. Now, with all of that said, license keys are one thing. But the fact that the machine was or is entitled to a particular operating system, um, IBM will actually let you download the operating system installation CDs for what the machine was entitled to. So if you buy a power system machine that uh, you know only ever was purchased to run AIX on, 
you probably won't be able to download the IBM I installation CDs. But if the machine in its previous life before it came to you was entitled to run IBM I, um, you can add that machine to your inventory in your account in Entitled System Support. And while you won't get the license keys for it um, or some other benefits from the ESS portal, unless the actual customer that, according to IBM's database, owns it, uh, grants your IBM account access to, which they probably won't do because they have no idea who you are if you just bought the machine off eBay, um, you may still be able to get the the downloads of the CDs to do the installation from, uh, from the ESS portal. So again, if you're in the market for used hardware, you just kind of have to accept that right hardware is hardware and it doesn't apply anything about the software that you're going to get or be entitled to use or be able to get license keys for or even be able to get the installation cds for um but that's part of the fun of being a hobbyist and collecting um old retired systems uh but in any case you can sign up for an ibm id you may already have an ibm id you can try to add your server to your ess account in your my inventory and uh once you're logged into this you're then able to go to your entitled software and download your licensed software. Now, even without the IBM I or the AIX uh, entitlements, the Power VM edition, uh, so again, you want to look for machines with standard edition or enterprise edition, should permanently be attached to that machine. Uh, I can't say that there are situations where IBM wouldn't take it away because I, I just don't know. In my experience, in the couple of power machines I've bought, um, they still have the Power VM edition installed in the firmware and that that entitlement is still tied to the machine in IBM's database. So uh, it's the Power VM edition, uh, if you have standard or enterprise, that should entitle the machine to then also run Vios. So in my case, uh, it actually, because Vios and PowerVM is independent of the operating systems, I think the choices will show up no matter which operating system you select. I'll just choose AIX. The AIX version doesn't matter. We're just looking for the PowerVM uh, version 2 stuff. And because my Power8 machine, which is in my inventory here in, uh, in the ESS portal, actually came uh, with PowerVM Enterprise Edition, I'm seeing Enterprise Edition and Standard Edition in my list. And I think it um, this website may actually get a little confused here, but I'm just going to check the couple of PowerVM Standard Edition options here. Um, the actual VIOS software is exactly the same. It's not like if you download the Enterprise Edition VIOS, uh, it's different than the Standard Edition VIOS and you can't run it or you're not you know, licensed to run it on your Standard Edition machine. The PowerVM Edition stuff is all controlled by the uh, the hypervisor itself and the firmware knows what version of power vm it's entitled to so let's just check those and hit continue and again we're looking for vios version 2 not vios version 3 and it looks like like i said i think it's confused it's only showing me enterprise edition because i have an entitlement to enterprise edition but um if we look at it yeah, so that's what we're looking for. And again, there's no difference in VIOS from standard or enterprise. It's it's the exact same version. It's the exact bit for bit same installation CD. So um, you want to look for the VIOS IO server version two. And I got version two by not choosing Power VM three on the previous screen. Um, right, you can see if Power VM three here uh, is virtual IO server v three dot whatever. We want the flash image, so the USB key image, instead of doing like a two DVD install of virtual IO server version two, um, and it'll be whatever the current latest version two installer is. So you just check that box, you hit continue, and uh, you can look at the license terms for that, um, which it includes a lot of, like it includes open SSH. So there's going to be an open source, you know, BSD style license for that. Uh, so you can look at all that if you care, but, uh, up to you eventually, if you in fact agree and are, um, licensed to use the software on the particular server that you plan on installing it for, we'll just download with HTTPS. Uh, if you're downloading a bunch of CD images from them, 
um, like the IBM I installation CD set is something I, th I think it's currently six DVDs. Uh, it can actually be faster to use their little Java download director um, app if you have Java on your system, but we're just downloading one image here. So we'll download it directly from the browser. And once again, you can confirm you're downloading V2. Click on that link, download the ISO. It's too big to burn on a, a DVD, but you can write this to a USB key. And that's what we're going to do. So I've already downloaded it. I've already copied it to a USB key. Uh, but you would do that just with the usual, uh, if you're on Linux, uh, you know, ddif equals you know, downloads, whatever the file name is called, of equals uh, whatever the USB key device is, something like dev SDC. Make sure it's not your actual hard drive. Probably want to run with maybe a block size of one megabyte for a slightly better write performance there. But however you get uh, operating system installation images onto raw USB keys is what you would do here to write that to a USB key. So we're done with the ESS portal for now after downloading the BIOS installer. Uh, let's restore this so we can see our little pop out thing here. And the next thing we'll want to do is get connected back to that serial port of the server. Uh, because remember the serial port on the back of that server will become the serial port for the operating system that is running on the server once it IPLs. So if I just hit enter, I'm back to the service processor login screen. We don't need to do anything there because we're controlling the system through the service processor's web interface. Um, but as when we used the standalone diagnostic CD, uh, we'll actually be using the serial console of the machine to interact with the installer for the virtual IO server. Okay, so we have the USB key. Uh, I'm going to power on the system. Basically the same settings as booting the diagnostic CD from the last video. We're going to boot to the SMS menu so that we have an opportunity to choose the boot device we want. And Vios is actually a little customized AIX distribution. Um, so like the diagnostic CD, we are in fact running AIX when we are uh, IPLing the Vios installer and then Vios itself. So I'll save those settings and power on. And then in a minute, we'll see the IPL process and the power on process begin. Uh, when we start seeing some of the codes here. Yep, there's the service codes there. And we will eventually see a bunch of the service codes fly by on this console before it becomes the um, the firmware, the PowerPC firmware, the boot firmware console. And then once we select the boot device, it will become the actual operating systems console that we are IPLing. So you can see, yep, the service processor logged us out. The fans are coming on now, and the machine is starting to power up. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to go plug that USB key into the back of the machine, um, use the USB ports on the back of the server, not the little USB port on that little pop-out uh, operator panel. I think that's the USB port specifically for the service processor if you need to uh, if your firmware gets really messed up and you need to reload that way, um, I think that might be what that's used for. I've never plugged anything into it because I don't want to mess up my service processor to a point that I would need IBM service, which would be impossible for me to get uh, to fix my Power 7 box. So yeah, plug that USB key into the back of the machine. And then as we saw in the last video, it will take several minutes for us to get uh, even to that first uh, firmware prompt. So I will fast forward the video for you so that you don't have to wait for that. All right, we are at the firmware prompt. So we'll continue to password entry, uh, enter the admin account password. And we just want to select boot options. So again, this is just like booting from that CD and video one, except this time we're gonna boot from the USB device. So I'll choose option one to select my install slash boot device. And as always, just always choose list all devices here. It will scan 
all the hardware and present you with the options um, that are currently available to boot from. We see our CD-ROM drive, but we're not using that this time. It looks like we need to go to the next page. So I'll hit N and there's our USB disc. So let's hit number seven. And we'll do a normal boot mode, number two. It asks, are we sure we want to exit SMS? Yes, we're sure. And that will continue the boot. So we have our nice big IBM starting software screen. Uh, if we look over at our web browser again, you can see that we are getting status codes. Uh, oftentimes, if you're curious what these are, you can just uh, Google them or DuckDuckGo them in my case. And sure enough, CA00E14D is load boot image. So that sounds reasonable. We are in fact loading the boot image off of that USB key. So, ah, we actually get a little progress spinner, which is nice to know that the machine isn't in fact just frozen and broken. Um, but as you saw booting the standalone diagnostic CD, it actually takes quite a while to boot these custom AIX uh, distributions and installation images. So uh, this could be a while. I will fast forward to the next time anything interesting happens. Well, that felt like an absolute eternity. Uh, however, the waiting isn't over yet. As we saw booting the AIX standalone utilities CD, standalone diagnostic CD, uh, when we get to this point, we know there's still several minutes left for the operating system to boot. Uh, you can see here, it doesn't even say welcome to AIX. It is a truly customized, sort of stripped down uh, AIX uh, installation, maybe even a custom kernel that says welcome to the virtual IO server. So it is a very special purpose uh, AIX distribution that uh, just exists to share the hardware resources to the partitions. And then in the case of the virtual IO server version two can provide us with the integrated virtualization manager. Okay, so that wait actually wasn't too much longer after that initial welcome to BIOS screen. Uh, please define the system console. As always, we'll type one and hit enter. And we'll expect something to happen here pretty quickly at this point. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we can choose the language. English will work for me. Uh, usually just choosing install now with default settings will be fine. Just to be safe, I always like to go with option two, which is to change or show installation settings. Because I like to make sure that import user volume groups is set to no. If you choose that default option one on the previous screen, it will set this to yes. Uh, and it may set recover devices to yes. Now, it doesn't matter in our case because in the previous video, we did a low level format of the hard drives, and we know that. Uh, all of the data is zeroed out in this RAID array, in the uh, logical device in the RAID array. So there are no user volume groups already on the disk to try to import or devices to recover. Uh, but if you're reinstalling BIOS, if you're just wanting to start over because you're experimenting and you haven't actually uh, zeroed out the hard disks and blown away the RAID arrays and recreated them, you may be surprised by your new fresh BIOS installation uh, actually bringing back to life some of your previous data. Um, also be aware that reinstalling BIOS doesn't get rid of the partition information. When you log back in to the integrated virtualization manager on a newly installed BIOS, because all that partition information is actually stored in the service processor and in the system firmware, the IVM interface is just a view into managing that. Um, so the, the, as I was playing around with this in the past, the first time uh, early on when I was 
you know, reinstalling and decided I wanted to try doing things a little bit differently, reinstall again. Uh, you know, I thought I basically reset and reinstalled everything from scratch, but all the partitions were still defined. And it's like, oh, right. Uh, those aren't really defined in the software at the software level that you're installing. I should go ahead and hit zero so we can get the installation going while I'm blabbing on here. Uh, they're actually, uh, again, the hypervisor is a feature of the hardware itself. It is in the firmware, uh, which is one of the big differences. Again, I compared to VMware because I think we're all mostly familiar with the VMware type uh, hypervisor, where the hypervisor, even when it's the, what is it, type one hypervisor that uh, VMware is when you're really installing the hypervisor's kernel on the metal, it's not running under another operating system. Uh, even then on x86 hardware, the hypervisor is software running on the machine, uh, taking advantage of the, uh, you know, the VT, uh, capabilities of the processor to, uh, to get good performance and virtualization. But on these power systems, like on the SunSpark systems, even if you just install one operating system on the bare metal, you're actually just running under one partition of the hardware-based firmware hypervisor software. So in any case, uh, we are now installing Vios. Uh, it's a make sysb based AIX uh, installation image backup. So it's basically just restoring a pre-configured, pre-customized, you know, with obviously all the additional special software installed, uh, custom distribution of AIX. So that'll take a few minutes. We will let it complete. I think it will basically just reboot on its own. Uh, so what we want to do now is go back to our power on settings. And because we no longer want the boot process to stop and for us to have to have that serial console connection uh, to tell it, yes, I want to boot, enter the admin password, enter the boot device. Uh, we're going to change the AIX Linux partition boot mode to continue to operating system. So from here on out, it's just a normal boot where it will continue to the first operating system in the boot order, which is going to be the operating system uh, that we're installing right now, the VIOS that we're installing onto our uh, our hard disk, our RAID logical volume. Partition environments, AIX. Uh, be careful here. Our save settings and power on button is now save settings and power off. We don't want to do that. We just want to save the settings. So now the next time it boots, instead of going to the firmware prompt and instead of taking us into SMS, it's just going to boot the operating system. And so now we can have unattended booting of our machine. And uh, with luck, that will take effect when this installation routine automatically reboots the system. So I will fast forward to when that happens. As you saw, the installer, uh, as we expected, did finish up, automatically re IPL the machine. One thing to note, it is much quicker to uh, re IPL once the machine has already been booted for the first time since the last power off. I imagine it doesn't rerun a lot of pretty intensive internal tests. Uh, and then because we had set the boot mode to continue on to operating system, rather than pausing back at the SMS menu, the system is now just automatically booting from that installed uh, VIOS partition on the hard drive. So the first time it starts up, it has a lot of work to do. Um, so we will let it do its thing. And in fact, perfect timing. Here we are. So IBM Virtual I.O. server uh, is now running. We're back to the normal sort of idle state of our machine. And uh, this is like I said, a specialized AIX installation. So the uh, the admin user, the root user we'll be using is named P admin. I imagine that's for partition admin. And it doesn't have a password to start with, so we need to set one. And we need to accept some terms and conditions. And we're in. 
uh, and this is actually kind of an interesting system. It is a restricted shell environment. So there's only certain commands you can run. You can't change out of the directory you're in. Um, so I, I don't think a lot of people have investigated the restricted version of uh, like KSH. I think there's a restricted mode of bash and uh, some of the other standard shells, but it's a way to set up a working environment where you're limited in the commands you can run and the parts of the file system that you can change directory to, um, even though you can still usually get to things by directly using full paths for things like editors, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but if you type, I think just help, it basically gives you, there's this whole custom command line interface for the virtual IO server. And these are basically uh, all the commands you can run. And they do let you use some shell commands, um, but you can't just run any arbitrary command. Now, this OEM setup inv command, just as a good to know, gets you out of the restricted shell and you'll be able to run anything. Now, before you run any of these VIOS commands, uh, it says you need to accept the uh, IO server license agreement. So you do that just with the command it tells you, license dash accept, uh, and that will accept the license and unlock all of the virtual IO server commands. Um, it's also telling you that the current system settings are different from the best practice recommendations for a VIOS. It has a little thing to analyze your system and apply um, sort of default rules. So it's worth doing that uh, to deploy the VIOS recommended default settings, run the following. I'll just go ahead and run rules-o deploy-d. And this will, I assume it's doing things like tuning disk IO settings and I don't know. I don't know much about the internals of AIX, but um, you know, maybe uh, process scheduling optimizations. Who knows what else? Okay, so those are applied, and it says that you need to reboot to apply those. There isn't really anything else we're going to be doing that requires a reboot. So let's go ahead and restart now, just to take care of applying those settings. So shutting down the VIO server could affect client partitions, yet definitely will if we had client partitions running. Continue. Yes, please. And now this will just be a regular Unix AIX shutdown, and the machine should re-IPL pretty quickly, uh, like it did after the installer finished and restarted. And we're back. Log back in as P admin. Now, really, the one important thing we need to do from the console here is get this on the network. So we already have our service processor on the network, of course, at 42.42. .42, um, but this is now an operating system actually installed on the server with that uh, network interface in the PCI slot. So I'm going to give my virtual IO server here the address of 42.43, .43, just the next one in line. So to do that, there is a command we can run, make TCP IP. Uh, and I think if I type help make TCP IP, yep, it'll give you all of the parameters for it. Uh, so we want to add a static IPv4 address. So we'll do make TCP IP, the host name, the address, the interface, which we plugged into the top port on the one network card that's in there. So that's going to be EN0, uh, echo November zero. We will start the interface. We will give it a net mask. Uh, you don't have to give it a cable type. <laughs> we'll give it the default gateway, the router address, and we can provide some name server addresses, and we can provide a name server domain uh, for the DNS domain that we're in. If you're into that weird IPv6 stuff, make TCP IP has got you covered there as well. So here we go, MK TCP IP. First parameter was host name. I'll just call this IVM because while this is the VIOS, as far as I'm concerned, when I'm accessing this machine over the network, I'm using the IVM 
web interface. Uh, the INET ADDR, we'll give it 192.168.42.43. The interface is E in zero. Uh, we'll start the interface when we finish this command. Let's continue on the next line. We'll give it a net mask. This is a class C, no surprises. My gateway, the router's at 192.168.42.1. And we can say name server address 192.168.42.5. I'm not sure how to list multiple addresses here. Um, so I'll just give it one. That's my, my primary one. It usually doesn't go down. And then, yeah, I may as well give it my name server domain. Uh, I assume this will let me just do partial host name. Uh, it just hosts name without domain, and it'll it'll look up those hosts in the domain. Uh, here at home, I have a home.mattwilson.org. So does that all look good? Make TCP IP host name 42.43, the router, the name server, and the mask. Yeah, that all looks good. So I'll just hit enter. And with any luck, I should be able to ping something out on the internet now. And I can. Okay, that's good. Uh, the last thing I want to do from the console, not as important, but if you look at the date now, you can see that it's defaulting to central time. Uh, I think the IBM power group is based out of IBM's, uh, what's the town in Minnesota where they are? Rochester, I believe. Um I suspect there's central time. So if you look at the help, I think there's a set date or set time option. It's not storage pool, not volume groups, device commands, uh, install commands, somewhere here. It's just like set time or set date maintenance commands ch date so if you look at help ch date you can give it just a time zone parameter so ch date dash time zone and then the unix time zone file for me is pst8 pdt for pacific time that switches to pacific daylight time um, although hopefully we'll just standardize on one or the other and if I log out and log back in, yep, we're now in Pacific time, and that is very close to my actual time. Uh, it's probably a good idea to set this up to sync with an NTP server. If you just Google for IBM Vios NTP server, um, it's pretty simple. In fact, I think there's a, yeah, in the config... Uh, you, you add your NTP service to config.conf, and then there's a command you run to enable the XNTP service. So I won't do that now because the time is already um, pretty accurate. But long term, of course, you'd want to sync to your NTP servers. Okay, we can log out from here. And let's go to the web browser. And we don't really need the status indicator anymore. We can actually log out of this uh hardware interface. And if we go to 192.168.42.43 on that new IP address, we get the integrated virtualization manager. So this is where we're going to spend most of our time when we're managing the system. Um, so just like the console, padmin, and then it's whatever password you set for padmin on the console. Uh, it gives you a little guided setup with some recommendations of things you can do. Um, we don't need to mirror the IVM because uh, our single disk is, in fact, already a RAID 5 volume um, <clears throat> on what are, in fact, redundant high availability RAID controllers. So uh, I'm not worried about a hard disk failure taking out my whole system. And it recommends, or it talks about virtual storage management, it talks about Ethernet, uh, assigning physical adapters, and then finally creating partitions. So we can just go down the sidebar here to see what's available. 
first time you log in, it'll say that you don't have PowerVM Enterprise Edition installed. Um, that's what gives you live partition mobility. Again, if you have multiple machines with shared storage, you can live migrate partitions, just like in a vSphere uh, fiber channel SAN environment. Uh, this Power 7 box, it only has PowerVM Standard Edition, so we don't have an Enterprise Edition key to install in the firmware. We just won't show that message again. Quick overview, the machine has 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, Vios itself uh, gave itself eight gigabytes for its partitions running in partition one. And uh, you can see how much that leaves after various other reservations as well. So we can run a, a few uh, partitions comfortably with 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, you can run a few Linux partitions. Uh, you could run an IBM I partition with a generous amount of RAM, say 32 gigs, and then still have nearly half your RAM left over to run uh, a couple of lightweight Linux partitions. And again, you can see processors, um, four physical processors. The PowerVM standard edition and better lets you do micro processor partitioning or something. So uh, I, I think basically for every virtual processor you want to assign uh, to be available to a VM, uh, it can do shared processing. So it can share these processors. I can have multiple VMs with four processors, um, but then you just have to actually hard reserve one tenth of a processor per whole processor you want to assign to a VM. So in reality, again, with 64 gigs of RAM, even if I created a ton of four processor, uh, four shared processor VMs or partitions, I'm not going to run out of my actual available processing units when I'm just giving them out one tenth of a processor at a time. Uh, anything of note here? Not too much. So again, each partition can have its own service codes being shown. So as uh, when we add partitions, as we start them up, we'll actually see those reference codes changing. The reference code on that physical little screen on the machine isn't going to change. Um, but the the IVM here lets us see the reference codes of each partition that's running on the machine, which is convenient. Uh, you can have some system properties here system name. Uh, if you want to completely clear the partition data out, this is the easiest way to do it. Uh, and then just restart and it'll wipe them all out. These are tuning parameters that I've never had to change. Uh, memory region sizes. Again, I've not changed these from the defaults. And then just overview of processing information. Uh, the first thing we do need to change is virtual ethernet. We need to create the virtual ethernet environment. And then we will tie if you look at virtual ethernet bridge for each virtual ethernet port we will tie it to a physical ethernet port so remember i have that four port ethernet card in the machine uh, which i actually plugged the network into the top port which is ent0 uh, so for the purposes of my guests i will assign all of their virtual ethernet controllers to virtual ethernet ID one. And then that is what will physically plug them in to that cable that I actually have plugged into the back of the box that's plugged into my network. Even though I don't have ethernet cables plugged into the other ports, I'll just map them all so that I always know virtual ethernet one is that top port, two is the next port down, three is the next port down, and then four is the bottom port of that ethernet card that I have installed in slot C5. Um, and if you have multiple Ethernet cards installed, if you actually look at the back of the server, all of the slots are labeled. So sure enough, C5 is the slot that that four-port Ethernet card is in. So I'll apply that, and that will create the whole virtual Ethernet virtual switch environment for me. Okay, operation completed successfully. That's what we like to see. Physical adapters is where you'd be able to assign entire physical adapters, so basically entire PCI slots, to a particular partition. So again, if you had an Ethernet card that you wanted to dedicate to your Linux partition, you'd be able to do that. And if you were running a high-traffic server, uh, 
you know, in a Linux partition, you probably wouldn't want to use that shared single Ethernet port that's being shared with everything else on this machine. You would drop in a gigabit or a 10 gigabit Ethernet card and you would assign it directly to the Linux partition. And then that partition would have direct physical control of that adapter. These concepts do exist in the VMware world. Uh, however, you usually don't have slot granularity control. Um, oftentimes, the x86 motherboards will have some PCI slots sort of on some kind of shared controller and then other PCI slots on a different shared controller. So you might have to, you know, give four slots to a VM or you might not have your hardware set up such that, oh, I really want to dedicate, uh, you know, this is... Uh, this Ethernet card to a, a VM or a partition, but I would also have to assign the USB controller to it, right? You get into silly situations like that. Whereas this hardware really is designed and architected to um, be able to, to divvy it up and really assign individual pieces of hardware to partitions uh, at the physical hardware level. We're not going to do any of that. We're happy with just the shared resources and installing partitions. Um, but you can see how easy it would be once you have a partition to modify which partition that actual slot's assigned to. Right now, they're all assigned to the VIOS partition uh, so that it is able to use all of the system's resources and then share virtual resources into the guests. Fiber channel, if you had fiber channel cards, this uses NPIV. This is actually how I'm used, doing storage on my Power 8 system. Um, but there is, I don't have a fiber channel SAN here at home, and I don't have the fiber channel card dropped into the server right now. Um, but if you are in a fiber channel environment, if you have a SAN, uh, you're probably familiar with NPIV if you've ever used fiber channel virtualization. So Essentially, again, you'd be able to assign uh, or create virtual fiber channel cards uh, for partitions that share one fiber channel connection to your fiber channel SAN switch. Virtual storage. This is an area that we will uh, use heavily. So if we look at storage pools, you can see that we got a root volume group of 390 gigabytes. This is that RAID 5 logical volume from our RAID controller that we installed VIOS onto. And so we still have 360 gigabytes of space here. And in that 360 gigabytes of space, we can create virtual disks uh, of whatever size we want in whatever unit we want. You know, we can make a 64 gig disk here that we would assign to maybe our Linux partition. And you can actually do it while you're creating partitions, so I won't do it here. But um, this is using the AIX Volume Manager. So you'll recognize things like VG for volume groups and PV for physical volumes. Um, but that's how this all works. So you can either create uh, virtual disks as uh, basically little AIX Volume Manager uh, logical volumes out of your volume groups. And then we also have physical volumes, which you can see that second RAID 5 array that I created in video one. So another 390 gigabytes of a different RAID 5 array. And you can assign the physical volumes directly to partitions. So in the future videos in the series, I think what I'm going to do is my Linux install. I'll just do a virtual disk uh, using a logical volume in my AIX managed volume group. And then for the IBM I installation, I think I'm just going to dedicate this entire RAID 5 logical volume to it. Um, so you're essentially passing a physical volume through to a partition. Uh, sort of like if you passed that physical RAID controller through the actual physical adapter, um, but through one extra layer of abstraction, because we're not actually passing the controller through, because that controller, of course, has the disks that we're using for everything else as well. So I can't dedicate the whole controller to another partition. Um, but the next best thing will be dedicating what appears to the operating system as a physical volume uh, straight through to a partition. This is also a very important tab, virtual optical. So when it comes time to install operating systems from CD or DVD, you could pass the physical CD-ROM drive or DVD drive through 
to the operating system and then walk back to your server and put the disk in and do all of that. Um, but it's much, much, much more convenient, and I suspect faster, to build a virtual optical media library. And then you can create virtual CD drives in your partitions and then uh, just choose the ISO images that you want to mount in them from Vios. So this is probably the most convenient feature of Vios versus just installing and running operating systems on the bare metal. Uh, obviously, aside from being able to run multiple operating systems um, as partitions and all that stuff, but the virtual optical media is a really, really convenient feature. Again, similar to VMware, right? You can have ISO images on your uh, VMware data pools and mount them in the CD drives of your virtual machines. So we're going to just go ahead and create that library right now since we're here. And that'll just carve out another logical volume from any volume group that we have on our system. So we'll use that root VG since that's the only one we have. And I don't know, when I think about the IBM I CD or DVDs that we'll eventually use and some other things, make it 25 gigabytes. You can always make it bigger later. So uh, it may be harder to shrink it, but you can always grow it. So you can start conservative, make it small, and then you can always extend it if you need to. Um, you can also delete it entirely and start over. So again, uh, usually you'll have those CD images somewhere else, so you can just re-upload them to the system if you need to delete the library and start over. We'll talk about adding media when we um, do our first operating system installation in the next video. Uh, you can add them through this web interface, but you're limited to two gigabytes, which is smaller than a lot of DVDs. So I'll show you how to do that by copying them up and using the... Um, uh, the SSH interface. You can actually, now that it's on the network, you can actually SSH into the box to get the console. So I can just SSH as padmin at uh, the IP address. And you're now at the, the uh, shell of Vios. So you don't need your serial console connection anymore. We're done with that. I can actually just go ahead and quit screen and... Uh, we're done with that serial console. Really, we'll never need it again for the life of this box because we can power the box on using either the, the little button on the front will now boot the BIOS, boot IVM, um, or over the network using the web interface. Um, and then once the machine's booted, we can use the IVM web interface and we can SSH into uh, BIOS to do any management of the BIOS that we need to do from the command line. As you can see, we're back in that restricted shell environment, uh, just as you'd expect. So, uh, where are we? yeah, so I'm not going to do the virtual CD stuff through the web interface. Um, we'll do that from the console. And then I have a tape drive in the machine. Again, you can assign the tape drive to a partition. So if you wanted to back something up to tape from your partitions, you could just temporarily assign that tape drive to the partition and work with it from there. So that's virtual storage. Again, that's probably the most uh, important part of the whole uh, virtual I.O. server capability is being able to make virtual disks and assign physical disks through to uh, partitions and manage your optical image uh, media library. You can create multiple accounts for this IVM interface. I've never created more than one because it's just me. Um, you can change your network settings from here. Uh, so again, now that it's on the network, we can go ahead and change it. You can see I have double the number of interfaces here because I have those shared Ethernet sort of virtual interfaces. And then I have uh, kind of what's left of, I think, how it manages some of the physical interfaces. So again, this network stuff you actually manage through virtual Ethernet um, so you don't get confused about what's what. And we just have our virtual Ethernet interfaces linked to the real physical interfaces. If you do have an Enterprise Edition key to upgrade to, or if you don't even have Standard Edition yet and you need to upgrade to Standard Edition, this is where you enter the key. Uh, and then you just have various stuff I never use here. Um, actually, I shouldn't say never use here. Managed serviceable events is important. Uh, from time to time, you will get random errors here. Um, even errors in partitions, like if you create a partition and you try and boot it, but you haven't, uh, you don't have bootable media available, it'll actually create a serviceable event. Um, sometimes it'll even turn on 
the light on the front of the server. Um, there's actually a couple different ways that can happen, but if you have serviceable events, usually one of the attention lights on the server will flash. Uh, this is just telling you uh, this adapter doesn't have a problem, but it looks like it might have been a problem. I think this is basically just because the link is down on some of the adapters or it was doing initialization stuff. So legitimate hardware errors can show up here, but a lot of the times I just select all, I close the event, put in my name. I think it requires a comment, so I put in a comment. That will close those problems. And when all of the problems are closed, it should turn off any attention lights that are on on the physical server. And those are also you'd be able to collect VPD information, so vital product data. Um, this will tell you information about a lot of your hardware devices, oftentimes serial numbers, firmware versions of disk drives, um, those kinds of things you might be able to get from there. Some of that you can also get from that uh, ASMI interface, the service processor web interface on dot 42, but you, you typically don't need that. Um, updates without a service contract, we're going to be on 2.2.6.65 forever. So no problems there. Uh, you can back up some of your information. To be honest, I've never played with any of this. Again, this is just kind of a play server for me. I'm not running anything in production. So, um, I've never looked too much into backups or redundancy or reliability or anything like that. But that's it. We have installed Vios version two, and we can get into our integrated virtualization manager. Um, this is really where all the fun will now begin. Uh, you've made it through two videos. Thank you for watching part one. If you did, thanks for watching part two, uh, since I know you're here watching it. And in the next part, I think I'm going to start with Linux, uh, just because that'll be a nice, straightforward, easy installation. And I don't think we'll get too hung up on how to install Linux, uh, whereas installing IBM I might be a totally new uh, experience and, and thing for, for most of uh, the people viewing this channel, uh, whereas installing Linux is probably something that you've done before, whether on physical hardware or in a VM. Uh, so that way, in the next video, we can focus more on how we use IVM to create the partitions, set up the virtual media, all of that kind of stuff, um, rather than getting hung up on how to install Linux. But then that will be the good foundation for us to then move ahead with uh, probably video four. We'll be installing IBM I, which is something that will be very new to uh, a lot of people, I think. So thank you again for watching. Uh, video three, if you're watching these live as they're being published, will be coming out tomorrow morning. Um, otherwise, if you're watching these after the fact, I'll try and get all the videos linked together in all the descriptions once they're all live so that I actually have the URLs for all of them. Uh, go ahead, and if you'd like to subscribe, that way the videos will just show up in your subscribed videos list. Feel free to ask any questions. Comment below. Uh, I always... Love to hear feedback about uh, how I'm doing these videos, if you enjoy them, if you have any questions, if I've left anything uh, unclear or ambiguous. But most of all, I just appreciate you watching. So thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.